We are jumping into part three of David and Goliath, and we're finally gonna talk about David and Goliath. And as you're gonna find in this episode, there are so many additional details around both David and Goliath that make this clash in the Ela Valley even more interesting and compelling than maybe most of us even know. So let's dive into this episode and see what we can learn. Your best against our best. It's the idea from the ancient world called single combat. The best warrior from one army versus the best warrior of the other army, and that will settle it. That is what Goliath is asking for in the Ela Valley when he is shouting to the Israelites. And this was one of the ways in which battles were determined in the ancient world in order to limit the catastrophic effects of war on an entire army. Now, I know that feels a bit antithetical because you go, but it's a battle. There's going to be casualties. Well, yeah, but even minor injuries could turn into something really significant because they didn't have the same medical advances that we have today. What's more and the more significant aspect behind why they would do single combat is because it wasn't just army versus army, it was deity versus deity. And they believed that ultimately the gods were duking it out and it would be made manifest through the victors of the battle. And so a single warrior could represent the army and the will of the gods on that particular day. And so this is something that is attested to in the ancient world. And some of you may go, hey, I remember watching that to start the film Troy. Yes, this is something that starts with the film Troy. And it was single combat, not just in Hollywood, not just in you know, ancient writers like Homer or others. It's actually attested to in the ancient world. And Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath, in the introduction does a really great job of providing some really helpful historical sources on this idea of single combat, as well as some other facets that we're gonna talk about in this episode. So, we finally get to David and Goliath. The last episode we talked about David and Saul, and in this episode, we're gonna be tackling David and Goliath. So let's jump in with Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, verse four, we read, and there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath. Gath is only seven miles from the Ela Valley. Uh, David had to come 14 miles from Bethlehem for the battle. Uh, Gath is one of the five cities of the Philistine Pentopolis. The Philistines took up residence on the coastal plain with the International Coastal Highway. Typically, as I've always thought about David and Goliath growing up, I'm like, man, Goliath must have come from a long way away. Well, the Philistines are a subset of the Sea Peoples that came out of the Aegean in roughly the 12th century BC, fought a significant battle against Ramses III in the Nile Delta, ended up on the coastal plain. There's a whole history that I just wrapped up in about eight seconds. Um, but all you need to really know is that Goliath came from Gath, a significant city seven miles from the Ela Valley. In fact, here's an aerial um, picture of the city of Gath. Aaron Meyer and his team have just done an amazing job with the archeological excavations there. Here's a photo of one such place, but the city exists. Uh, you can excavate it, you can walk through it, you can see it. Just a really cool thing to consider when you're talking about 1 Samuel 17. Continues, whose height was six cubits and a span. A cubit was the distance from your middle finger to your elbow, and obviously that changes based on how long you know your arm is, but generally speaking, it's an average of 18 inches, and a span is the difference from your pinky to your thumb. And so six cubits and a span is nine and a half feet. That is huge. Not unheard of though from the ancient world. We have anthropological evidence of very tall people from this era that have been found in excavations. And so 
That is a very, very big dude. Um, in fact, it's interesting, some of you have probably done additional studies and you'll know from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Older Testament Hebrew, that they actually reduced his height to four cubits in a span. So that makes him six, six. So we don't know, was he literally nine foot six or you know, did the you know, Hebrew writers of the Masoretic text you know, try to talk about, hey, we're gonna increase his height because he's so big. Is that why you know, later um, folks reduce that height? We don't know, but either way you shake it, Goliath is a big dude in comparison to the Israelites that we know from anthropological evidence as well that the average Israelite was 5'5", approximately 125 pounds. And so Goliath is a big dude. Now, the Bible never calls him a giant. We obviously surmise that based on his height, but we know he's a champion and we know he's really strong. How do we know that he's really strong? He had a helmet of bronze on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That is a unit of weight. It's 125 pounds is just his coat of armor. It weighs probably the same amount as David does to put that into perspective. And then it says, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. That's more than 15 pounds. Some of you will like go and pick up a 15 pound dumbbell and you think, yeah, that's pretty heavy to be just the tip of your spear that you're throwing. Goliath is buff. All right, and his shield bearer went before him. So those are the descriptions we're given of Goliath. And you know from the rest of the story for 40 days, he's out defying the armies of, of God. He's shouting at the Israelites. He's a cocky dude and he's ready for a fight. And onto the stage comes David. And as David, in our last episode we talked, gives Saul his resume as well as a bit of a confrontation on who's the real shepherd here, we see that on the heels of the conversation with Saul, Saul at least feels comfortable enough to grant David the right to go into battle against Goliath. It says that then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go out in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them, so he took them off. Now remember from an earlier episode, Saul is a head taller than anyone else, which means that it's not just that David isn't used to wearing the armor, the size of Saul compared to David, there's a huge discrepancy. This doesn't even fit David. If David is gonna wear armor to go out into a battle, that's not the size that he wears. And so David goes, okay, I, so I can't do this. And then it says that then David took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with the sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now, just real quick, because I know some of you are gonna send in questions around, why did David choose five stones? I don't know, okay? Yes, Goliath has four brothers, and if David takes out Goliath, maybe he thinks the brothers are gonna come. How does David know that Goliath has four brothers? I don't know. Um, some go, well, there are five books of Moses. Clearly, David is a man after God's own heart. He's very interested. He has a high faith in God. Maybe it's somehow connected to you know, the five books of Moses and God's word. Um, some people jump into gematria, which is numerical values connected to Hebrew letters to derive further meaning to why there's five stones. I don't know, maybe David is just really pragmatic and he goes, if I'm gonna take out Goliath, the Philistines aren't just gonna lay down and say we won and if they come after me, I'm gonna need a few extra stones in my pouch. But he chooses a sling and that is really significant because this is a deadly weapon in the hands of a skilled shepherd or Warrior. We'll get to that in just a few moments. We've alluded to this in our last episode, and I want to look for a few moments a little bit deeper at the weapon of the sling. Now, the stones that a slinger would use are not like these little pebbles. Um, these have been found in archaeological excavations from the Late Bronze Age and to the Iron Age one, which fits to the storyline of David and Goliath. And these are huge 
Like these range anywhere from a golf ball to the small, that's the smallest, up to a tennis ball sized rock. And when you put a rock of this weight into a sling that has got two ends of a rope or two ends of leather and then a pouch in the middle, and by the way, here's a guy demonstrating that, you put one strand around your index finger, another one around your pinky, and you sling the stone around with the sling, you let go with your pinky, and then the stone comes flying out. And because they've tested this, that stone comes at you faster than 100 miles an hour. It's equivalent to a major league pitcher throwing a rock at your face, not a corked baseball, like an actual rock over 100 miles an hour. That's what a slinger was able to do. Now, and it's not just shepherds who used a sling. This was used in ancient warfare. Uh, you have three primary groups that soldiers would fall into for ancient warfare. You've got infantry, which are your foot soldiers. This is what Goliath is. He is heavy infantry. The dude's wearing 125 pounds of coat mail. This is your hand-to-hand -hand combat, up close and personal. You've got your cavalry which are your people who are on horseback or are in chariots. These are your agile warriors. And then you have your artillery, your projectile warriors, which are both archers as well as slingers. Those are your two projectile warriors. And the slingers are really dangerous. Uh, we read this in Judges 20, 15 to 16 to under the, understand the skillfulness of slingers. At once, the Benjaminites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their towns, in addition to 700 able young men from those living in Gibeah. Among all these soldiers, there were 700 select troops who were left-handed. Now, literally in the Hebrew, it reads, bound or restricted in the right hand. Meaning it doesn't just seem to imply that you just had all of these lefties in the tribe of Benjamin, but that they actually trained to be lefties by binding their right arm. And you go, is that really what's going on? Well, here's what we have first of all, and then I'm gonna show you why I think that is the case. They were left-handed, each of whom who could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. That's what you call accuracy. Deadly accuracy. And then notice this passage from 1 Chronicles 12. These were the men who came to David at Ziklag. So now we're talking about David's era while he was banished from the presence of Saul, son of Kish. They were among the warriors who helped him in battle. They were armed with bows and were able to shoot arrows or to sling stones right-handed or left-handed. They're ambidextrous. They have trained to become left-handed. At least that's what the language implies. And then it says they were relatives of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Did you pick up on that? Both stories are dealing with the tribe of Benjamin. Now, here's what's ironic about this on two levels. The first is Benjamin in Hebrew, Binyamin, literally means son of the right hand. And you get all these Benjamites who are left-handed or have become skillful enough with their left hand. So there's an irony in that. And then the other irony is, what tribe is Saul from? Benjamin. What tribe is David from? Judah. David is using the weapon that Saul's tribe is renowned for. And David goes, that's my weapon of choice because that's what I have learned and have become very skillful in. And he goes and he grabs his sling and some stones and he walks out into the Ela Valley to go against Goliath. And this is a story that has always been told about how David was the underdog going up against the great champion Goliath. And that's true, but I think sometimes we have oversold the underdog aspect. Because those who study ancient warfare will look at this scenario and they'll go, Goliath is heavy infantry. Slingers are deadly accurate. The moment that David gets out of Saul's armor and grabs a sling and some stones, Goliath 
is a sitting duck. That when David gets out there, he sees the advantage and we read, then it happened. When the Philistine came closer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David goes, my opportunity is now. And he runs into the battle. He knows exactly what he is going to do. And so you've got this story of David and Goliath, and this just brings another level of understanding between David's weapon of choice and Goliath's weapon of choice. Now, one other thing, and then we're going to kind of tie up what can we take out of this story, is that one of the things that scholars are positing today is that Goliath maybe had something called acromegaly, it's giantism. And the acromegaly is a disease caused by a benign tumor of the pituitary gland. And as a result of that, there is an overproduction of growth hormone. And that's why you have some of these folks that become really, really tall. Um, we've got stories of that. Those who are in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the tallest human beings had acromegaly. And one of the side effects to acromegaly is poor vision. And there are three details in the story that seem to connect to Goliath not having fantastic vision. So let's run through these very briefly. The first is he has a shield bearer. That's weird. Infantrymen had their own shield because it was up close and personal fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat. Those who typically had a shield bearer were the artillery, the archers, because they are holding a bow and pulling back with a string. That both hands are on the bow and the arrow. And so you have a shield bearer that would hold it in front of the archer so that as they're shooting, they're not getting hit. And yet he's got a shield bearer which makes you wonder, does the shield bearer serve more as an attendant who's giving him instructions as the opposing warrior starts to get closer? Because off in a distance, perhaps Goliath can't really see as well as he would like to. Um, second observation, the Philistines send to David, I'm a, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Plural. We read the passage earlier that at least when David went to the brook, he had a staff in his hand. Did David drop the staff and only have his sling when he went out in the battle lines? We don't know. But at most, at least in the story, David has a stick singular. So why sticks plural? And then the third is, is that the Philistines said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beast of the field. Why does David need to come to him? Why can't Goliath go to David? Again, maybe his eyesight isn't great and he's beckoning David to come to the battle line. We don't know, but it's something that people are positing to the story itself. But here's what the big takeaway is for me, is in connection to what happens when David goes running into the battle. And of course, we've got to read this passage. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Like David latched onto the opportunity. He knew what his window was and he took it. And with skill and precision, he dropped Goliath. That when you just kind of step back from this story, one of the things that I think we can take away as it relates to David is that David didn't fight on Saul's terms, nor Goliath's. Saul wanted him to fight a certain way. Goliath wanted him to fight a certain way. And David had enough wisdom to go, I have to live into the skill set that I have been given, that I have developed, and that I need to use if I'm going to do what God is calling me to do. And so I think that there is something about the gift set that is important, but I don't want to overemphasize this. And so that's why I just want to spend a few moments on this passage from the chapter before when Saul is looking for someone to help him. One of Saul's attendants answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is a skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, a good countenance, and the Lord is with him. And I think that detail at the end is huge. The Lord is with him. That David did not just rely on his skill set. 
He lived into what God was calling him to do, what God was empowering him to do, and David knew that God was with him in what he was about to do. And I think this just leads us to just this recognition that God has uniquely gifted each of us with certain gifts and skills, and that the calling here is to do what God has uniquely gifted you to do. So often we want to play by the rules of other people. We want to fight battles or engage circumstances the way someone else would. And at times we just fail to recognize that God has uniquely gifted us to do things that he is asking us to do. And that so often we may go, I wish I had, you know, what this person has, or I wish I had this skill set, or I wish I had this opportunity. And we almost undermine the skill set that God has given to us. And what I love about this story is that David lived into the gifting that God had given him, that he had cultivated with his skill set around slinging. And when he knew the time was right and God was calling him into something, he ran into the opportunity, even though others may have thought, what's going on here? This is a dumb situation. David goes, no, I know what I've been gifted to do and I am going to go and I'm gonna use those gifts. And I would just submit to you, God has gifted you in a unique way and not just gifted you uniquely, he has strategically placed you where you find yourself. And so often we can look at where we're at and go, this isn't where I wanna be or this isn't really an important job or an important position. But just recognize if God has placed you there, he sees it as being important. And our responsibility is to be faithful with the giftings that God has given to us and to recognize that wherever God has placed us, whether it is in the business sector or in nonprofit world or in education or in media or in politics or wherever God has placed us, he's done that intentionally and he wants to work through us to impact other people's lives. And I believe that if we are faithful to the gifting that God has given to us in the position we find ourselves, that God's going to work through us in order to bring about his purposes in the world. So do what God has uniquely gifted you to do. Don't try to be someone else. Don't try to do what someone else would do. Do what God has gifted you to do. So friends, there you go. Part three, David and Goliath. We've got one more part left in the mini series. We'll see you again real soon. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And may you walk out the text well in your life.